Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Autism Stories. I'm your host, Doug Bletcher, the founder of Autism Personal Coach. Autistic people are the true experts of the autistic experience, and Autism Stories is where we interview autistic people to learn from their stories, experiences, and get their insights. If you would like to be notified about each week's episode of Autism Stories, we suggest you subscribe on your favorite podcast listening platform. We would also appreciate it if you could give us a positive rating and review, as it will help others to learn about Autism Stories. On today's episode, Sophia Gretsch joins us to discuss her career as an opera singer and being the ambassador for autism for the Maltese government. We hope you enjoy today's conversation. Sophia, thanks so much for joining me here on Autism Stories. Oh, you're very welcome. It's a pleasure. I'd love to start out by learning where does your story in the autistic community begin? Growing up, I had autism, but I didn't know that I had it. So I'd say really that my autism story itself uh, began about nine years ago after my partner uh, said to me that he thinks I have autism. I went and uh, to my GP, went through the diagnosis process and was diagnosed with autism. Now, by this point, I'd been having an, an international career for about 20 years. So I made the decision not to tell anyone that I had it. Um, the trouble is, I don't think you can really keep these things secret for very long. So eventually, it, you know, I started to spill a bit to various people about me, me having autism and became inundated by the national press asking for me to give interviews, which which I actually declined because I again I just still wanted to keep it a secret from the press, if you like. But eventually, the, the Daily Mail, so the Daily Mail newspaper, reached out to me, and I decided to do the interview. And I thought, you know, why not? Let's just do this. Now you mentioned uh, your career. You're an opera singer who's performed at concert halls, opera houses, and international. Uh, festivals worldwide. Anyone that reads the bio on your website is definitely going to be truly impressed by um, where you've performed throughout the world. So I'm wondering, you know, when you learned about your autism, how has that shaped your career then and maybe nine years later? T to be honest, this ended up being quite a juggling act uh, with my career and um, various autism work, if you like. It's, um, and it's fine now because I found a happy balance. I mean, obviously, originally, I hadn't planned to tell anybody about the diagnosis. But, you know, after a bunch of media interviews, you know, I realised that my life was probably going to change somewhat. And today I found a happy balance between giving performances and like speaking at conferences and doing a lot of guest appearances to raise funding and awareness. And I'm also an appointed ambassador for a number of associated organisations. You know, I'm very honoured to represent some incredible charities. And they, they sit close to my heart, you know, including a British charity, Autism Unlimited, who do some really great groundbreaking work. I mean, actually, I imagine that a lot of your listeners are probably in the US. I'm also in it, the international ambassador for the American non-profit organisation, Angels Castle. Now, they're based in our... Ohio, and this is for young adults with intellectual disabilities, and they're currently building a state-of-the-art educational and recreational campus. It's going to be amazing. It's going to help a lot of youngsters. I could have done that when I was a teenager, but we didn't have anything like that then. You mentioned uh, talk, you were talking about giving performances. I'm wondering about accessibility needs you might have in order to be the best singer you can be. Have you asked for certain accommodations from the venues you've performed at? And if so, what have been the responses uh, you've received? Actually, it's, it's interesting because um, I've actually never asked the venues to accommodate my autism in any way. Um, I think it's because I've personally worked out coping strategies to deal with that myself, which I'll cover in a bit. It's not so. It's not really the performing because I've worked out coping strategies. I can. I, I've. I've learned to manage that, and I will. I will cover how I do that in a minute. But it's actually other events that happen as a result of my career that can be really tricky. Um, for example, like mixing with um important people because I've had to mix with people like heads of state and and royalty. I've got a funny story actually. <laughs> 
so uh, many years ago, I was um, in uh, the food chain McDonald's, just having a drink and a chocolate milkshake. And I had a phone call and it was the office of the president of Malta. And it was his office requesting that uh, basically the president requested my company for dinner that evening. And um, I mean, you can imagine it. I mean, you know, he's a president of a country. So, OK, the uh, anxiety was pretty up there. I think the anxiety would be up there for anybody that had that phone call. But if you've got autism, obviously, it's it's going to be harder, isn't it? So I thought, oh, it's going to be OK because there'll probably be about 500 people there and I can just get lost in the crowd. But as it turned out, there was only about six people invited. And when I walked in, he said to me, oh, Sophia, do come and sit next to me. So, uh, I mean, it's such an honour and a privilege to be invited to uh, join, you know, a president for dinner. But obviously, you know, that it takes a massive strain on the autism, obviously. But I managed and, again, I've worked out ways to manage those situations. Now, now um, regarding my coping strategies to manage performances and venues, uh, there are a few things that I've taught myself over the years. And one of them is... Um, that staging for me can be quite difficult because although musically I don't struggle with the um, conductors, how can I put it? Um, so if the conductor is obviously conducting us it, musically, he'll give us instruction and that's absolutely fine. I've never had a problem with anything to do with the music, but it's it's just the stage director's instruction. For example, move stage left, move stage right, all those type of things became quite difficult for me. So. What I did is I learned that if I draw coloured pictures of every single uh, scene in every opera that I do, and I, when I say coloured pictures, so everybody's the colour, not a name. So all the characters will have colours, the chorus will have a colour, stage right will be a colour, stage left will be a colour. And then I use these colours and I draw pictures of all the staging with all these colours and then I put them up in my hotel room and I study the pictures, and I'm absolutely fine. I just, then when I'm performing, I know what picture I'm on and what colour I'm on, and I can just absolutely use that to manage the staging, and it works absolutely brilliant for me. And, yeah, I had, obviously, throughout my career, kept that secret, but in later years, no, I, I became, I told people, I'm drawing a picture of the staging and colouring it in. It looks like a child's drawing, to be honest. Um, and everybody accepted that. And they were like, oh, that's interesting. And I explained what, I, what I'm doing. And that's how I managed that. Another problem that I have, particularly with my autism, is um, a skin sensitivity. And with me, it's everything feels itchy to me. So I have a lot of itchy costumes, <laughs> if you can imagine, and ball gowns. And they're so itchy. But I've actually worked out a way to manage that. So, for example, I'll wear pyjamas, uh, especially pyjama bottoms, under my itchy costumes. And then it's absolutely fine for me. You know, I can recall walking out on stage at the Royal Albert Hall wearing a really expensive ball gown and I've got a pair of pyjamas underneath. Well, obviously, the, the audience don't know that. Well, they probably do now, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I'm quite open about that now. But obviously, years ago, I just hide that. But it's fine for me now. From what I understand, in recent years, your favorite performances have been concerts with uh, some of your closest colleagues. That definitely makes me think about community and connection, which isn't the easiest thing for us as artistic people to find. What's been your experience with finding meaningful relationships in your life through music? Yeah, that's really interesting, isn't it? Um, yeah, I agree with you. It's very difficult for us as autistic people to, to find meaningful relationships. And I think in the workplace, it's probably really difficult. You haven't exactly chosen those people either, really, especially if you work in an office situation. Obviously, I don't. So I can't, I, yes, it is difficult. The thing is with my career is because I'm a soloist, I kind of work alone in a way. There's, there's always a saying that uh, the, a career as a soloist is a lonely career. And I have to say to that, but I've actually liked that. <laughs> I love the fact that I'm, I'm on my own and I travel everywhere alone. You see, most of the time, I don't even know the people that I work with. So I, I'll turn up to a, a venue and I have like a big orchestra playing and I won't, I won't really know the players, especially if I'm travelling abroad. Sometimes you're in a country where 
they don't really speak English. You probably don't even speak their, you don't speak their language either. A conductor, I've had one concert where the conductor didn't, didn't even speak the same language as the orchestra. And I didn't speak the same language as them and they didn't speak the same language as me. So we, we use the musical language to, to get through the performance, but there's not really that opportunity to go and have lunch together or anything. So, however, I have been really lucky and carved some incredible lifelong friendships with some colleagues over the years. The problem there is, is that I don't really see them very often because I don't live near them because they live all over the world. So unless we have a perf performance together, there isn't really like the opportunity to kind of hang out with them. I think working with friends is really great because they understand my autism and they can be really patient. And I really appreciate that. In fact, I give a shout out to uh, my pianist, Sonia Stefanovic, and, uh, who lives in Germany, and uh, my trumpeter, Chris Bistel Perkins, and pianist, Leslie Pearson, and American trumpeter, John Holt. You know, they've been really supportive, especially when I was diagnosed. And I really treasure their friendships. I, I think that's really interesting, having friends all over the world. And it just makes me think just in general for a lot of artistic people, you know, we connect with people online. I'm wondering, do you feel like people not being in this so close to you in the same like physical proximity has helped those relationships in any way? That's a really interesting point. It probably has actually, because if they were, you know, living near to you and then you're seeing them every day, perhaps there's always that you might start arguing. <laughs> <laughs> You you meet them for tea or coffee, maybe there's uh yeah. Yeah. So I, I see what you mean. Yeah. I mean having you know, friendships with people that are just are so far away, I think that there's it's lovely when you haven't obviously lo not lovely when you haven't seen them for ages, but um it's quite nice when you when you haven't seen them for a while and then you do see them because there's just so much to discuss, isn't there, and talk about and I mean, we're lucky, aren't we, today that we have social media and that we have computers so we can always, like, Zoom each other or talk on WhatsApp or... So in that respect, it's really nice. Beyond being a singer, you're also an author. You wrote the book, I Wish I Could Sing, which is a singing guide for amateurs. I know there's a lot of talented autistic singers out there that would love to have an opportunity in the music industry. What would be some suggestions you may have for them? It's a very tough career to get into, obviously, whether you have autism or not. It's, it's tough. Uh, regarding the book, you know, I've, I'd always wanted to write a book about learning to sing and I wanted to make it incredibly easy. So I spent years thinking about how I could condense really hard vocal technique into really easy methods that anyone can manage from age five to 80, if you like, <laughs> And I wanted to make it really accessible to everyone. And so it's perfect for those who are neurodiverse, as they may actually prefer to study from a book rather than take singing lessons. You know, singing lessons, apart from the fact that they can be expensive, it's actually quite hard for somebody with autism, I think, to find a singing teacher that they can really connect with. Now, regarding the career, my advice, it actually depends on what type of career you want in singing. I mean, because there's so many options, obviously you've, with me, it's opera singing, but there's also musical theatre or well, there's um, pop singing. Um, you know, each one requires different advice. For example, you need a lot of qualifications to be an opera singer, but you don't necessarily for pop music. And in my book, there's actually a section where I do give a lot of advice um, on singing careers. Something that many people can say that they are are an ambassador for autism by a government. However, that's exactly a role that you have with the Maltese government. What exactly do you do in this role? It's, it's really fantastic. So I've been visiting Malta and giving performances and interviews for many years. And I'm also a dual national. As my role as ambassador, so I support uh, Malta's national autism strategy, which is set out by the Ministry for Inclusion and Voluntary Organisations, uh, led by uh, the Minister, Julia Ferruja portelli Now, I collaborate with them on, on projects in the community. So, for example, like singing workshops. And it's also lovely to visit their charitable and educational organisations in the field of autism and support them. Also, last year, I was re really delighted when they published and launched my singing book, actually in the Maltese language, which is really helpful for everybody over there who wants to try singing. And I feel really honoured to be their ambassador I think some countries are really making headway in the field of autism, and Malta is certainly one of them. 
I'm just curious, like what's been your experience in terms of a lot of times businesses or organizations, or I would certainly imagine governments as well, are not great at listening to the kind of lived experience of us as autistic people. What's been your experience with the Maltese government in, in regards to that? Oh, they're in, incredibly open and, and they take time to listen to uh, what people want. They have time to listen to what people need. And certainly when I've been talking to them, um, th they really do take on board, you know, what I feel and, and what I say. Well, I've conversed a lot with um, a lot of the people in Malta. So like students that have autism studying at the uni, you know, and uh, they really, they really feel supported. I think they're very lucky to feel that way because I think in some countries it's, it, it's much harder, um, especially when you have a government that doesn't even have a ministry for inclusion because some countries don't have that. I think that Malta's fantastic and it's really striving the way forward and trying to almost, you know, putting it forward for other countries to have a have a section of the government, which is a ministry for inclusion and uh, voluntary organisations. And then lastly, Sophia, how can our listeners learn about you beyond this interview? Actually, if you just go to, uh, if you just go to Google... Google and pop my name in, quite a lot comes up if you want to just check check me out a bit more, learn a bit more about the work I do. If you want to learn more about my autism work, then there is a section on my on my website, which also includes details of various charities that I support. Well, Sophia, I really appreciate the time today. Thanks so much for talking to me here on Autism Stories. Oh, oh you're absolutely welcome. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much. Yeah.